All right. Um, well, hello again, everybody. And we're starting our next session and with Donald Hoffman. And Don is a professor emeritus in cognitive science at the University of California, Irvine. Um, his research and his PhD was in back in the day was in computational psychology. So uh, his research includes visual perception, evolutionary psychology, consciousness, and artificial intelligence. And as you'll hear today, he has some very radical views on the nature of consciousness, reality, and everything else. And he's also written a fair bit on one of my favorite subjects, which is the idea of holograms and holographic thinking. And he and I were just chatting, and maybe that'll come up in the course of his talk today. But if not, I'll probably want to ask a question about it. But in any event, uh, we'll be hearing more about holograms actually on Friday um, from Cheng Shin Pan, who's one of our presenters. And his whole talk, I think, is going to be built around holographic holographic analogy or metaphor. So, um, so I will leave it at that. Uh, the title of Don's talk is Consciousness Beyond Space, Time, and Quantum Theory. And um, please take it away, Don. Well, thank, thank you, Alex. And uh, the title is uh, about consciousness beyond space, time, and quantum theory. And that might sound a little odd for a boot camp on quantum social science, but you know, science always progresses and we're always looking for the next thing. And so maybe this will be a, a peek ahead at, at perhaps what might come after quantum theory and space-time. Um, so space-time uh, has been assumed to be fundamental, either space and time or space-time as a union for centuries. Um, and it's been a fantastic uh, foundation for science. It's been an incredible uh, foundation for all the progress we've made. And in the case of work on consciousness, um, it's been assumed the, the, the space time and its particles are fundamental has been assumed by all of the major theories of consciousness, basically global workspace theory, integrated information, theory of micro, you know, neuronal microtubules, and, and even um, you know, those who like Dennett and, and Frankish who say that consciousness is just an illusion, um, it's still uh, you know, it's based on a space time and physicalist interpretation. So in all these cases, they assume that space-time is fundamental and the particles in space-time are fundamental, fundamental objects. These particles give rise, um, you know, through their complicated interactions to more uh, macroscopic objects such as brains. And the right ma macroscopic objects with the right properties give rise to you know, our experience of consciousness or to the illusion of consciousness. And so that's the, I would say 99% of the um, theories of consciousness are of this kind that's, that assume that space and time and the particles in space and time and their complex interactions are the foundation. And somehow that gives rise to consciousness. Now, there are, of course, panpsychist theories as well, Philip Goff and, and others, uh, which, um, and he's got a more recent one, uh, you know, cosmopsychism we can talk about as well. Um, in, but in panpsychism that I'm thinking about, again, space-time and the, and the laws of space-time, the laws of physics are fundamental. And there, there, are, there are these particles which are part of that fundamental framework, but uh, behind them, the, the reality behind them is consciousness. So in some sense, as, as Philip says in his forthcoming book, um, you know, he, he uses the word universe to talk about everything there is. And he says that um, the universe, uh, which is everything there is, um, is constrained by the laws of physics. So even in his cosmopsychism, he's saying something along this line. And Philip and I are discussing that difference in our views. But it, it turns out that there's a group of physicists, so-called high energy theoretical physicists. So it's not all physicists, but it's um, high energy theoretical physicists who, who are probing the, the, the limits of our current theories of space-time. And they're, they're forced to because they're dealing with very, very high energy events. And what these many of these um, physicists are saying is that space time is doomed. It, it cannot be fundamental. It's had a good ride for several centuries, um, but, but it's over. And we need a new framework that's, that's deeper than space time. So just to give a couple quotes, Ed Witten um, at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton says space and time may be doomed. Nathan Seiberg, also at Institute for Advanced Studies, says, I'm almost certain that space and time are illusions. 
These are primitive notions that will be replaced by something more sophisticated. Strominger, Andrew Strominger at Harvard says, the notion of space-time is clearly something we're going to have to give up. And David Gross, a Nobel laureate um, said, uh, I believe that space for sure and presumably time as well will be emergent. And one more, Neymar Kani Hamed at the Institute for Advanced Study says the very notion of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There is no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics. So, so this is a, a radical claim by these high-energy theoretical physicists. <clears throat> and <clears throat> David Gross, um, in a 2005 paper, ex explains a little bit about why they're making this move. In that paper, he explains that there is no operational meaning to distances smaller than the Planck length. And what he means by that is, suppose that you try to measure something that's small. Well, you know, to look at smaller things, we need bigger microscopes. And what we're effectively doing is um, using smaller and smaller wavelengths of light or some other kind of you know, radiation um, to try to resolve the details of the object we're trying to study. And that's fine in quantum theory. In, in principle, you can use as small a wavelength as you want. Um, and as you do that, the energy that you're using goes up. Um, the, the energy is proportional to the frequency. And so uh, as the wavelength goes up, the energy goes up. And that would be fine in a world with just quantum theory. But in a world with gravity, uh, it leads to disaster. Because at a certain point, the, the amount of energy that you've um, put into a small region of space is so great that effectively the, the mass of that energy collapses the space-time and you get a black hole. So you, you destroy the very thing that you're trying to observe. And this happens at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And if you get frustrated and say, well, I'll just you know put more energy in there, try to use a smaller wavelength, what happens is the black hole just gets bigger. You actually... Um, can't solve the problem by just trying harder. So there is, in this sense, no operational meaning to space and time um, beyond the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And for what it's worth, that seems fairly, to me, fairly shallow. It's not 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, it's just 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So space time is, in some sense, a pretty cheap data structure that we've been saddled with, and it doesn't go very deep. So the search is on for, for deeper structures. But now I'll turn to, to a moment and just say um, that some work that I've done with some colleagues in evolution, uh, using evolutionary game theory to study evolution of natural selection, uh, agrees with what the physicists are saying. Um, we asked this technical question, does natural selection favor veridical perception? That is, would, what is the probability that natural selection would shape sensory systems of organisms to see true properties, true facts about the structure of the objective world, whatever that might be? And so that's a clean technical question, as it turns out. It's not, I mean, it's not just stuff for you know, beer parties on Friday night. It's actually a clean technical question. You can use evolutionary game theory. And, and so uh, with Chaitan Prakash and some graduate students, uh, uh, Justin Mark, Brian Marion and, and others and, and other colleagues, uh, we've studied this in some detail and the theorems are, are clear. The probability that any sensory system has ever been shaped to see any true structures of objective reality is zero. And so that means that the structures we see of objects in space-time, which are what we've been shaped to see, the probability that that is, in fact, giving us an insight into the true structure of objective reality is, according to evolution by natural selection, precisely zero. And so that would completely line up with what the physicists are telling us, the, the high energy phys physicists are telling us, that space time is not fundamental. Um, it's And it has no operational meaning beyond the Planck scale. That, and there are deeper structures. If you want to find reality, you're going to have to go beyond space time. So evolution agrees. and one way to think about what evolution has done, I mean, it, it's very, very clear that evolution, according to Darwin's theory, shapes sensory systems to guide adaptive behavior. 
that that's very very clear so our sensory systems guide adaptive behavior and that means they um, guide behaviors that keep us alive long enough to reproduce but guiding adaptive behavior is one thing seeing the truth is something entirely different uh John, and so sorry to interrupt like we see your screen of your desktop right now is that your main to be or just something happened on a computer we saw your desktop right now is that what I'm seeing? Everyone else seeing? So I did. I did a screen share. Did you not see my slides? No, we. It's just a switch to your desktop. Just at the moment, at least it's from giant, my computer. It's a giant rock that we're looking at. Yeah, right? we're looking at your trash can. Right. Oh, right. now it's back. You, now it's back. Great. Yes. Okay. Did you guys see these slides? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Oh, now it's all so, We just finished it here. Oh, yeah. Now we switch to here. Oh, okay. So so we're good now. Yeah. Um, now it's back to your. Uh, did you mean to show your desktop? No. Oh, but now we can you flip back? Flip back. Yeah. Now we can see your slides, but then the next one is your desktop. Oh, the, oh, this is uh, well. This is um. This oh, is your. This is your slide, right? It's a slide. This, this Perfect. Is a slide. That's what I thought. Great. Okay, Thank right, you. Right. Just double check. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, no, it, it's a slide of a desktop because I want to use an analogy of the desktop. Right? Perfect, so, that's what I thought, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, I thought there was a technical issue, okay. Um, yeah, so suppose that, um, um, you know, you, you can think about what evolution has done for us. It's given us sensory systems that are like a desktop, like a user interface. They, that in your user interface also guides adaptive behavior in some sense with respect to the computer, uh, you know, but, and, but no one mistakes the interface for the truth. So if I have that, uh, this, this blue um, folder on the lower right corner of the screen uh, for some, some talk I'm giving um, or some paper I'm writing, that doesn't mean that the folder itself, the, the file in the computer is blue and like rectangular and in lower right-hand corner of the, of, the, of the computer. No one would ever think that. It, it's just the, the user interface is there not to show you the truth. It's, it's there to hide the truth. You don't want to see the diodes and resistors and megabytes of you know code and so forth. You just want to have eye candy that gets you uh, lets you do what you need to do. And so that's what evolution has done for us. It's it's um, created us a space time desktop. So space time is just a desktop, and objects are in, inside space time are just the icons in the desktop. It's a three D desktop, or you can think of it you know, as a virtual reality. We've, we're immersed in a, a virtual reality space time as our VR headset, and, and we're playing the game of life. Um, and it's just like in like if you're playing a virtual reality, like Grand Theft Auto or something like that, you render things on the fly. When you, you know, if, if I'm playing Grand Theft Auto in virtual reality and I see to my right a um, red Ferrari, um, well, the red Ferrari um, is just an image that I render when I look, and when I look away, the red Ferrari no longer exists. And there's no red Ferrari literally in the supercomputer that's running the VR game. And and so so we render on the fly what we see, and and when we look away, we delete it, we garbage collect it. And so so that's the idea. Evolution has shaped us with space time as just a desktop, a user interface. And this seems to agree quite well with what the physicists are saying that space time cannot in principle be fundamental. Now, one implication of this is that uh, reductionism is doomed. Now, redu reductionism as I'm using it, you might call it micro reductionism, is the idea that as we go to smaller and smaller regions of space, um, we find you know, more and more fundamental objects and more and more fundamental laws. But as, as um, Nimar Khani Hamed puts it, um, the entire reductionist paradigm that fundamentally physics is given by some laws at the ultra most microscopic distance scales and somehow we just have to go there to see what's going on is ultimately false because of gravity and that part about because of gravity is this thing that you know when you look small small enough you create black holes due to gravity so space time falls apart so so reductionism also falls apart and 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 so these high energy physicists are m moving beyond uh, not only space time, but also this kind of reductionism. Now, we've we've had reductionist theories for for millennia. I mean, we used to think earth, air, fire, and water were the fundamental elements in which we could reduce everything. Uh, that didn't work out too well. And then for a while, we thought atoms um, were the fundamental constituents of reality. Um, 
And that worked out better, but we've you know quickly learned that that's not the fundamental constituents of reality. Today we have the standard model of physics, which it, with its you know leptons, bosons, and quarks as sort of the the foundation um, of this reductionist kind of paradigm. But what the physicists, the high energy physicists, are saying is that um, this cannot be fundamental. There's got to be something beyond space time that gives rise to space time. So. But the current theories of consciousness um, are, of course, not taking any of this into account. They're still on the micro-reductionist framework. And they assume that um, the, the particles of the standard model are the, are the fundamental particles. Um, and, and this is true even in, for example, uh, Philip Goff's um, panpsychism. But, and that your know, larger objects, such as pyramidal neurons, as shown here, are simply um, you know, complex combinations, interactions of these fundamental particles uh, that emerge. And then when we get in, you know, at even higher levels, we get uh, physical objects like brains that emerge. Um, and then these brains then give rise in, in these various theories, uh, brains and, and other physical objects that have the right kind of com you know, complexity, um, circuit complexity or um, neuronal complexity or whatever. Um, will give rise to consciousness. So that's the standard view right now. Now, what's interesting is, even though I would say 99% of my friends and colleagues who are doing this research are, are physicalists and reductionists, um, they have not yet solved a single specific conscious experience problem in the following sense. Uh, there's no theory that can explain any specific conscious experience from a physicalist framework. And this is something that Steve Pinker pointed out um, with respect to the global workspace theory, but it holds more generally. In his uh, 2018 book, um, Enlightenment Now, Pinker likes the global workspace theory, but he, he admits that the last dollop in the theory, that it subjectively feels like something to be such circuitry, may have to be stipulated as a fact about reality where explanation stops. And, and, and Steve is exactly right. Um, in all these theories, uh, whether it's integrated information theory, collapse of uh, neuronal microtubule quantum states, or the global workspace, and so forth, in, in each case, um, the theories, no, none of those theories can say for a specific conscious experience um, how their theory ex gets that particular experience. So, for example, what specific pattern of integrated information must be the sound of a saxophone and could not be the sound of a trumpet. What specific um, coherent, a uh, global co coherent collapse of quantum states of um, neuronal microtubules must be the smell of a rose and couldn't be the smell of garlic. What um, global workspace um, pa pattern of connectivity or architecture must be the, the, the taste of chocolate and could not be the, the smell of, 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 you know, mint. There's, there, there's not a single specific conscious experience that's ever been explained, not one. So we're batting zero on these theories for, and for specific conscious experiences. So, and the reason I think is principled. Space-time is not fundamental and reductionism is false. And so, so the whole framework in which the current study of consciousness is being studied um, is, is, is doomed to fail. Um, it, it has no more chance than starting with earth, air, fire, and water. If you start with the wrong ingredients as the foundation, you, you won't be able to do it, no matter how smart you are. And, and my colleagues are brilliant. The, the, the people who are doing this are, are absolutely brilliant. But now, in, in, relevant to our current conference, um, these same theoretical physicists, many of them are saying that quantum theory is not fundamental as well. Uh, and so, for example, Nimar Khani Hamed says, so there's some other structure that we're looking for, you know, beyond space-time. And some way of thinking about interpreting this structure that will let us see space-time and quantum mechanics emerge simultaneously and joined at the hip. So, so this, these higher energy theoretical physicists are, are saying, Space-time isn't fundamental, and we can't use quantum theory 
to try to boot up space-time, like from entanglement or something like that. What we need is something beyond space-time and beyond quantum theory that will give us space-time and quantum theory simultaneously joined at the hip. And so that's where a, a lot of the interesting research is, is going on right now. So, so it's not that, again, that space-time and quantum theory are nonsense. It's, they're, they're beautiful scientific theories, and they're the best that we have so far. But it's the glory of science not to get stuck in the current framework. And so they're, the avant-garde in the high-energy the theoretical physics uh, region is finding new structures beyond space-time and quantum mechanics. In other words, they're finding structures beyond where there are Hilbert spaces. There are no Hilbert spaces in the structures they're finding. So as, as Nima puts it, we're, they're looking and finding structures and ideas that don't look like anything having to do with particles propagating in space-time and wave functions involving in Hilbert space. And th they're, they're using data on scattering amplitudes to guide their search. Um, scattering amplitudes happen like at these colliders where you might have two gluons smash into each other and four gluons go spraying out. Um, and you look at the, the probabilities, what they call amplitudes, for the various kinds of interactions of, of scattering of particles. So, it, for example, gluons smashing into each other. And they found... Um, they've actually found some structures beyond space-time. So this is fairly new. Um, it's, it was published, uh, it was discovered in 2013, published in 2014. So the publication of this is less than 10 years old. Um, they've, uh, Nima and his collaborators found a structure that they call the amplitohedron, a geometric object um, entirely outside of space-time. So this is, you know, don't think about something like a, a complex object curled up somehow in, in tiny dimensions inside space-time. You have to think entirely outside of space-time, outside of the box of space-time altogether. And if, it, if you have a hard time doing that, just think of space-time as your headset. We have a, a cheap VR headset that we call space-time. And what the physicists are saying is um, you can think outside of the headset. We can take the headset off. We, we have to use mathematics right now to do it, but we can take the headset off and explore what might be beyond our space-time headset. Now. What they find is not just, uh, so they found the geometric object called um, the amplitohedron, also cosmological polytope and, and other interesting structures. But one of the deepest structures they found is shuffling, what, what they call decorated permutations. So decorated permutations are, are permutations. You know, like, like if you have three numbers, one, two, three, there are six ways that you could reorder the numbers. And those are the, the six permutations. Decorated permutations, uh, you know, in the Q and A, if someone wants, we can go into the details of it. It's 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 a little twist on on permutations, but basically, it's it's just permutations with an interesting twist. And it, for those who are interested, we can go into it. So, what the physicists have done then is they said space time is doomed. It's just a headset, basically, but they found uh, these uh, static structure like the amplitohedron and so forth um, beyond space time and behind those um, decorated permutations. So, the, so this mathematical structure. Um, beyond space time. And, but this is, so this is all brand new. It's all in the last 10 years. Um, and so this is, it's quite interesting in science. We, we've taken our first step outside of space time and we found permutations in, in a, a structure like the amplitohedron. You know, th these are like obelisks um, beyond space time. And, and they, they, they seem to be very important, but what do they mean? They were very much like, um, the the apes in uh, 2001, a space odyssey, right? Where they have the obelisk and they're all pounding on it and hooting and hollering and screaming and running around. They they know it's it's full of meaning, but they, they don't know what it, what it means. And and we're in the same position right now. We've only just in the last 10 years taken off the headset enough to find structures beyond space time. And who who would have predicted permutations or the amplitudehedron? Who would have predicted it? So what do they mean? What do these structures mean? So, so now I'll turn a little bit to uh, one possibility. What's interesting about the structures the physicists have found is that they're not dynamical. These are geometric uh, um, or, or static structures. So what about a dynamics, um, a dynamics of entities beyond space-time? So 
well, so this is what I'm going to do for a theory of consciousness. I'm trying to get a theory of consciousness. All of my colleagues and, and myself included to, to begin with um, started trying to come up with how physical systems that are complicated enough could give rise to consciousness. That can't work because space-time isn't fundamental and reductionism is dead. So what about starting then with a network of a dynamical network of conscious agents um, outside of space-time and see if we can't have that be the dynamics that gives rise to the structures like the decorated permutations that the physicists have found, which we could then use to explain how space-time emerges and scattering amplitudes. So that's that's the idea. So a conscious agent. What we tried to do in our definition, it's a mathematical definition, um, but I'm going to give the intuition, is that it's we have the very simplest thing we could think of for a conscious agent. It has experiences like the taste of chocolate, the smell of garlic. Based on those experiences, it decides what action it's going to take. Once it's decided it on the action, it acts, and that affects a network of other conscious agents. And the actions of those agents then uh, affect the perceptions and the experiences of the original. And so we get the, the whole loop closing. So this is what we'll call a CA or, or conscious agent. And the key thing here mathematically, for those who want just a little mathematics, each of these um, ovals, the experiences, the actions, and networks, are we modeled with just probability spaces. And each of the arrows um, are Markovian kernels. So it's probability spaces and Markovian kernels is, is all the mathematics here. So we're having we're proposing a Markovian dynamics. Now, if for those who are interested in the physics problem and couldn't care less about consciousness, then just say we're proposing a dynamics of entities beyond space time and some Markovian dynamics. For me, I'm interested in consciousness, so I'll call it a dynamics of conscious agents. Now, in a theory of consciousness, there are dozens and dozens of things that you would like that theory to, to deal with, including uh, learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, uh, free will, and so forth. As you can see, we took a very, very small starting point, experiences and essentially decisions to act. That's it. We have qualia and choices based on qualia. That's it. Um, we have to build all these other things that a theory of consciousness has to do. We're going to have to build out of networks of conscious agents. But but that's no problem because it's, it's a, a trivial theorem that um, these Markovian networks of conscious agents are computationally universal. So anything that can be computed with a neural net can be computed with a network of conscious agents. Um, and it's also the case that um, these networks actually aren't limited to computation because the measurable sets on which the probabilities are defined don't have to be recursively enumerable. So it's not only um, computationally complete, but it goes beyond computation. So these networks have all the power we need to, to do the construction of learning memory, problem solving, and so forth um, from the very simple beginning that we have. And that was our intention. You know, Occam's razor, have the simplest assumptions and explain as much as you can. So our idea then is that our network of conscious agents projects via a couple projections that we can talk about. One is trace chains and others called sampling and so forth, down to decorated permutations. And that, by the way, was uh, when we fir first worked on this, we, we thought, okay, so we have this Markovian dynamics beyond space time. Um, if we want to connect with the, what the physicists have done, we need to connect it with these decorated permutations because that's going to, you know, the physicists can take us into space time if we can get to these decorated permutations. So surely there's been mathematics done on Markovian dynamics and how it projects to decorated permutations. And we we did our search um, and we never found anything. So we we published a paper in January where we um, actually added some new mathematics, um, where we actually show um, a canonical projection from any Markovian dynamics, not just a conscious agents, any Markovian dynamics into decorated permutations. Um, and, and then that, then the physicists take us the rest of the way uh, to the amplitudehedron and into particles, you know, scattering in space time. So, so that's the, the, the big, the big picture here. We have a, and, and notice how this differs from panpsychism or, or, or even uh, Philip Goff's new uh, cosmopsychism. Um, Philip would say that the, um, the laws of physics, the laws of physics inside space time, um, 
are a fundamental limit on the nature of the universe, where he takes the universe to be everything there is. And what I'm saying is, is no, no the space time is not the entire universe. And, and, and fitting consciousness, shoehorning conscious experiences somehow inside the laws of space time is, is not understanding where the high energy physicists are going. They're going entirely beyond space time to structures like the amplitude hedron and decorated permutation entirely outside of space time. And they're going to get the laws of physics inside space time as projections of much deeper laws. So, so what we're saying is that consciousness, this network of conscious agents is entirely outside of space time and space time and the laws of space time is one only one perhaps fairly trivial projection of the dynamics of conscious agents we it's one headset if you want one virtual reality that conscious agents can use and there are countless others that conscious agents could use my my guess is that uh our 40 space time is one of the cheap models but there are countless others out there now um we can take the definition of conscious agent and this is just a little technical the, you know those the kernels you know in spaces that we talked about we can put um letters to them like the decision kernel call it d the action kernel call it a and the perception kernel call it p and we can create what, what i could call a qualia kernel a markovian kernel which is just the composition of them it actually should be dap i, I wrote it backwards but okay and if we have so if we take two conscious agents and take what we might call one bit conscious agents, uh, agent one only sees red and by itself, it, it sees red and, and its action is to you know, prompt itself to see red again. And Q2 is uh, see, you know, uh, seeing green. We can then have these agents interact and have a, a, a two agent interaction. Um, and here's the Markovian kernel. Q of XY is the Markovian kernel describing uh, a, a new conscious agent. It turns out whenever uh, any agents interact, they in fact form a new conscious agent. So this is very much like the intra-action notion of Karen Barat, where the, the agents themselves um, emerge out of interactions. Um, so it's, it's it's quite nice that way. And, and here X is the probability that the um, that, that this agent will see green, given that it saw red. And Y is the probability that we'll next see red, given that it's currently seeing green. So those, that's what X and Y mean for this for this new agent. And you can make agents that are you know three, four, as or, or you know, a million um, conscious experiences, and and write down huge Markovian kernels for uh, uh, an agent with a million conscious experiences. It would be a million by a million um, Markovian kernel. Uh, the matrix would be it would be a matrix of a million by a million ent ent entries. This diagram just shows all possible conscious agents that have um, two experiences. This is, uh, it forms a Markov, what we call the Markov polytope, M2. Uh, at the lower left-hand corner is um, the Markov kernel uh, 1001, um, which is the identity matrix. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see it's the, the kernel 0110, which is the not operator. And in between are all the different possible two by two Markovian kernels. And each one of them corresponds to a possible conscious agent. Um, so there's a very rich, as we go to, you know, um, N dimensions, um, the, the Markov polytope for N conscious experiences has N to the N vertices. So it, it, it explodes exponentially the complexity of these things. Uh, and each though contains the Birkhoff polytope within it, um, uh, on, on, which is the set of permutations basically on N things. Um, for time purposes, I'll just mention that when agents interact um, for a long period of time, um, they're, the kernel, it, it's a property of these kernels that as you take the kernel Q and multiply it by itself, Q to the N as N goes to infinity, um, eventually, in general, it, all the rows will be the same. In other words, you can see here in the, in the, the the bottom matrix one minus alpha and alpha one minus alpha and alpha the the rows become exactly the same and so the the kernel drops rank and so instead of um having you know n different um conscious experiences 
this agent has just one. And so this is what we call the fusion of agents and qualia. In the limit, um, you get uh, not just a convex combination, a combination of, of, of separate conscious experiences which retain their identity, you get a brand new conscious experience by fusion. So in this case, for example, if the first agency is red, the second agency is green, um, then the third agent with the right mixture could see um, yellow. Uh, and alpha would be the parameter between them. And, and there's a whole one parameter family of new conscious agents with new qualia that emerge from this. So this is getting at the so-called combination problem that the, the panpsychists have trouble with. It, it, it falls out of the mathematics of, of, of the conscious agents pretty straightforwardly. When you have three qualia, um, it, it turns out that it, with n qualia, the, the fusions form an n simplex. So here's the, the three simplex for um, red, green, and blue. Um, and, and each each point inside that's colored with the, you know, to indicate the color of the fusion that would occur. I couldn't do four because screens can't handle that big. So, so once again, the idea is that there's a network of conscious agents. Um, there's a canonical procedure and we've published it. Um, in it, it, The paper is called Fusions of Consciousness and I'll give a reference at the end of the talk, but, but anybody can read the mapping from um, Markovian dynamics onto decorated permutations. Um, it's, it's straightforward. And that then the physicist can then take us into space time. So we in principle have a mapping from a network of consciousness outward outside of space time through decorated permutations into space time and particle scattering inside space time. When we look at what our map from Markov chains to decorated permutations is saying, what it's telling us is that the things that physicists call particles are projections of what Markov chains call recurrent communicating classes. That's That was, so we didn't know this. We, we first had to write down the mathematical mapping from Markov chains to to decorative permutations. But once we had the mapping, we could then become students of our own mapping and ask that mapping to teach us what part of the dynamics of conscious agents is critical to understanding um, the projection into physics and, and particles. And it turns out it's the recurrent communicating classes. I've, I've got a kernel here, Q prime, and uh, I've shown in, in red, green, and blue, um, there are three communicating classes in this kernel. Um, a, a recurrent communicating class uh, um, are, is a set of states where once you get into that set of states, you can't get out. It's, it's a roach motel. So if you look, if you're in states one and two, which are highlighted in red, if you're in state one, you can go to two or one, but you can't go to three, four or five or six. So you can only go to one and two. So each one of these is a roach motel. Um, and that's, that's what a recurrent communicating class is. Um, we can generalize this. We can have, um, you know, the top is what we could call free particles. Um, the top matrix has the green and the blue um, uh, with recurrent communicating classes. Those are free uh, unbound particles. Um, and they would actually be space-like separated in when they're projection into space-time. Um, the second matrix, which has a little bit of stuff in red, um, has the same particles, but there's a slight interaction now. So these would be bound particles, like electron bound to a proton to make hydrogen. And then there are what we call confined, where the they're not recurrent. There's a completely different thing they um, that we can go into if people are interested. So we can model ultimately free bound and, and confined particles through um, uh, this mapping of Markov chains onto the decorated permutations. And we can generalize. So I talk about recurrent communicating classes. We can generalize this, um, sort of weaken up the recurrent communicating class idea to what are called um, you know, communities of states instead of just recurrent classes of states, communities of states. You can take each uh, Markov kernel and associate it canonically with a, a directed cyclic graph and then um, find the communicating classes, uh, the community graphs uh, for those. So we can generalize this. So when we do this then, we, we have, um, the idea that, that 
recurrent communicating classes um, have the properties that we need to, to study for, for, for particles. So what, what corresponds to mass? We, we um, have put out a proposal just a couple of weeks ago that mass is the entropy rate. So mass of a particle in space-time corresponds precisely to the entropy rate of the corresponding uh, ent uh, commu uh, recurrent communicating class beyond space-time. Momentum corresponds to the number of states in that recurrent communicating class. The spin is the determinant, um, if, if, well, um, a function of the determinant of the Markovian kernel of that communicating class. And um, something we're working on right now is that distances in space-time will probably fall out of the commuting times um, between states. The, the commuting time is how many steps on average does it take to get from one state to another state and then back to the original state. And just, I, I have two kernels down here at the bottom just to get the notion of entropy rate out. Um, the entropy rate for the kernel on the right, P, 0, 0, 001, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, that entropy rate would be zero um, because the entropy of each row of that kernel is zero. The entropy rate um, depends on the entropy, adding up all the entropies of the rows. So any periodic kernel, Markovian kernel, will project to a massless particle. And uh, the Q kernel on the left um, will have a non-trivial entropy rate, the non-zero entropy rate. And so it will project to a massive particle. So we make a, a clean prediction that massless particles in space-time correspond to periodic kernels um, outside of space-time. So, so this is not a hand wave. Um, uh, we can be shown wrong. We're proposing to do experiments, computational experiments, to see if we're right or wrong. So briefly, um, we're going to look at quarks and gluons. But just to put that in perspective, right? everyday matter, like a, a guy surfing, uh, is made out of molecules which are made out of atoms, which are made out of electrons and, and, and nuclei. Nuclei are made out of neutrons and protons, which are makes out, made out of quarks and gluons. This is our current physicalist understanding of matter. And so what we're up to is we're going to try to map, um, to test our theory of conscious agents and our, our proposals about mass, spin, momentum, and, uh, and distance. Um, against the data that colliders have collected on quarks and gluons inside the proton. That's where we want to go. And the reason we're going there is not because we think quarks and gluons are the most interesting thing in the world. It's because they're the simplest thing inside this headset that's getting as close to the quote unquote pixel level as you can. Um, yeah, brains are closer to, to what we might be interested in terms of correlations with uh, you know the neural correlates of consciousness in the brain that we want to study. but um, we'll have to crawl our way back up um, to macroscopic matter uh, systematically. We, we can't just jump there. We need to make sure we're clean at the bottom. So just a top level, what the physicists have found is that when they um, look at the coarsest scale inside the proton, um, so the, the, with the lowest energies and, and, and the, the, the largest temporal windows that allow you to appear inside the pr proton, they, you see it's dominated by what they call three valence quarks, um, two up quarks and one down quark. When you crank up the energy a bit um, and make the time resolution a little bit finer, uh, you start to see, in addition to the valence uh, quarks, you see a bunch of um, uh, quark-antiquark -quark pairs, what they call a quark C and um, a bunch of gluons too, so a gluon C. And then when you crank it up to the highest energies that they've been able to get and the smallest time scales, what you see inside the proton is a mess of just gluons. It's a gluon C, um, just a writhing sea of gluons. Um, that's a qualitative description. There are these quantitative curves um, um, which give you the momentum, the one dimensional momentum distributions that they've found from colliders over decades. And so, the goal of our experiment is to um, show that we can get exactly, we can find it, uh, Markovian dynamics of conscious agents is projection into space-time, which gives exactly these momentum distributions inside of, of quarks and gluons inside the proton. Then we'll climb our way back up. So for those who are interested in the math of this, and um, there's a paper called Fusions of Consciousness, which gives you the mapping um, from 
any Markov kernel into decorated permutations, not just conscious agents. So any Markovian kernel into decorated permutations. And um, for those who are interested, I, if you go to the Institute of Noetic Sciences, um, our proposal for uh, actually testing this against quarks and gluons, um, uh, um, we, we submitted it to them and, and um, and I've, I've, if anybody's interested, I can give you a copy. Just contact me and I'll give you a copy of it. So with that, I'll just say thanks to many of my collaborators. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll highlight in particular on this recent research, Chetan Prakash. Um, and in the very, very recent research um, um, with the mapping to mass and spin and so forth, um, Ben Nepper and uh, Schwapon, uh Chatterjee. He's told me not to try to say his last name, so Schwapo and Chatterjee. And with that, I'll stop and, and be happy to talk, uh, take questions. All right. Well, thank you, Don. That was really interesting. Um, so, Joyce, are you moderating again? Is that? Yes, I will okay. try here. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Don, for the very uh, mind blowing talk, as always. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just uh, uh, so many questions to address. And, uh, I'm so glad that you were highlighting it's not hand waving and it's falsifiable and just so much work to do. Can you maybe I take the kind of a little opportunity here as a moder moderator to ask like what um, what um, you know what what's the status now for the falsification or testing those models? Well, uh, I can say that um, we're we're. It, these mappings onto mass, spin, momentum, and distance uh, have only, we've only come up with those just in the last three or four months. So this is all brand new stuff. Yeah. Um, and now we realize that what, you know, so, so Chaitan is a mathematician, he's a brilliant mathematician, but you know, every mathematician has his areas of expertise, his, his fields. And, and, and we're collaborating with Schwapon Chatterjee, who is um, a, high energy experimental physicist. He's one of the top experimental physicists at CERN and also at Fermilab. And he's a professor of um, physics at, at UC Berkeley. So, but, but he's an experimentalist. So he's, he's, he's collaborating with us, but what we, we need, so here's, I'll, I have my hat in my hand. We do need help. We need, believe it or not, someone with a recent PhD in algebraic geometry. It turns out to make our next steps we need some really high-powered help in algebraic geometry, and we also need a high-powered, um, uh, high-energy theoretical physicist, pre preferably someone who knows Nima Arkani Hamed's um, work on the amplitude and so forth. So, so we're actually looking to get some collaborators for our next step because we're going to continue to work as we can. But you know, I'm I'm just a lowly cognitive scientist. All this math, I have to just like learn and learn and learn, and then go to Chaitan and say, "How how am I misunderstanding this?" Right. So so we we need some real serious um, some, and, and if we if there were two or three uh, algebraic geometers, I think we we could use them all. So this is this is what we're going to need to move forward. But that's fun, you know. It, it, it's it's beyond the hand wave stage. We know there are now specific hard problems that we want to tackle. Um, I mean, I could actually start writing simulations now, but I want to flesh out the theory a little bit further before I start writing the simulations. Yeah, thank you. I mean, to all the young scholars out there, <laughs> and also, I mean, in the as a, as a meeting, and also whoever wants to change their career, have more exciting change right now. Here is a call. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I totally sympathize with that, and sometimes maybe not from the math side, but also from even empirically, sometimes so challenging to get those kind of data. Let's be able to test the theory. Sometimes extremely hard to, in my own experience. Well, well, yes, and that's another reason why I'm very pleased that we're gonna, we'll be able to use the work of these colliders. The 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 work that we're going to be trying to model has been collected over decades. There's tons and tons of data. It's it's very very precise data. There's, there's no wiggle room here. So we either can match it or we can't. No hand wave whatsoever. If you cannot come with a mark, uh, come up with a Markovian kernel and a projection that leads to these precise momentum distributions, then you're wrong. So, so that's what we're, what we're, we're after. So that, so that's the goal here. Um, that's really exciting. Yeah, yeah. pretty fun. 
I mean, we are talking more maybe at one o'clock. So here, Q and A, I just want to make sure those people had questions here can be addressed. So from, I, uh, I think, Professor Derek Der Kirkhoff, um, he asked us three questions here. One is something that would help the desktop mentor for is uh, comparing it to our dreaming. So we believe they are true until we wake up. But when we do, we know that we they have been produced by our sleeping condition. What theory of consciousness refer to that basic human experience? I don't what I don't understand. What's that last sentence? Okay, what a theory of consciousness refer to that uh, basic human experience? I think he meant um, consciousness, a theory of dreams. It, is that well, well, so? Certainly. Um, dreams are conscious experiences, right? So there, there's there's no doubt that they're conscious experiences. Um, we, you know, you feel emotions, you see colors. Um, I actually had a lucid dream once, um, and when I realized I was having a lucid dream, I, I said, "Oh, well, I've always wanted to know if I dream in colors." So I quickly went and got uh, some comics, the, the funny paper, and and there, there, there they were in, in color. So I, I, I confirmed to myself that I can dream in color. So, 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 yeah, there are qualia there. Um, now, yeah, I guess maybe what this questioner is saying is that it might be helpful in people for people to understand the the user interface metaphor. If you think about you know your dreams, the dreams aren't the truth. They're they're just something that that's that that you come up with, right? They're not they're not. We don't think that they're the external reality. And and what I'm saying is that yeah, everything that you perceive right now when you're awake is is not the truth it's just a vr headset so yeah dream dreams if, if you have a hard time dreams might be a way to, to help you with that i agree yeah oh matrix the movie okay so yes. <laughs> here's the second uh, question from derek here interesting your conscious agent which as you mentioned actually in your talk is very close to what karen Barron calls the agentia interactive operator that yes. somehow summons the real in quotation mark but not as something referring to anything external, nor strictly internal, rather something that does not need that sort of dif differencing, namely no need for ontologically space-time either. It, it, exactly right. So I think that there is a, a, a deep uh, similarity, in, at least at top level, between what, what Karen is doing and what, and, and what she's saying and what we're saying. We. Um, the fact that these conscious agents, their mathematics is such that any interaction of conscious agents is another conscious agent, is this very much like her inter interaction kind of, of notion. You know, what 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 one thing that's different is that we have a you know, mathematically precise definition. It is so it, we've gone from a philosophical theory of interaction to here is a precise mathematical version of interaction, and we're going to take this precise mathematical version of interaction and test it against quantum chromodynamics. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Karen, her, her PhD was in lattice QCD, lattice quantum chromodynamics. So, so we're, we're actually headed back to where she started, which is, you know, the lattice QCD. Now we're going to, so we'll be able to look at what lattice QCD has, has come up with, and then also look at the actual particle scattering and use both as a test of our theory. So yeah, the, the circle closes. Thank you. And then now last question from Derek. Aren't the high energy physicists looking for yet another ontology? Yes. So they're well, what they're looking for right now, see, so you, you have to have, you know, sort of sympathy for the situation of these high energy physicists. We're letting go of space-time for the first time in human history as scientists, right? Of course, mystical traditions have talked about this for thousands of years. But but they've only talked metaphorically and, and and imprecisely. Now it's scientists who are saying we're going to use the tools of science and step outside of space time. Well, okay, no one's ever gone there before in terms of science. W what do you do? So what you do and what the what and it, and it's brilliant is you, we have to use the so quantum field theory. And general relativity are telling us that space time is doomed. So they can tell us the limits of our current framework. They, they say at the Planck scale, 
it stops. It doesn't work anymore at the Planck scale, but it can't tell you what's next. So, it, so that's the thing. A good scientific theory tells you where it stops, but it can't tell you what's next. So you have to be bold. You have to be, you know, you have to step into the unknown. But here's where the theories help us. What, and this is what uh, Nimar Khani Hamed and these others are doing. Um, they're making bold proposals of things beyond space time. And then proposals about how these things project into space time. And when you project them back into space time, you have to get back the quantum field theory that we know and love. If you don't get it back, then you're wrong. So that's so that's the thing. The, the, so this is the, the and this is the fun of science. For those who really love science, this is the real fun part is when we're making the transition, right? What uh, Thomas Kuhn called this, the, the the revolutions in science. Our, our, our good theories, the mathematics of the good theories, tell you where the theories stop. Their assumptions can take you this far and no further. And then they can't tell you what, what next step you have to take. So the, the scientist has to just jake, take a jump, take a leap into the unknown. But then you have to project it back into the theories that you know and love. And it either show that you get back that same theory or a natural generalization of the theory. Maybe we don't get back exactly quantum field theory, but we get back something that includes quantum field theory and maybe corrects it inside space-time. So that's where that's how the physicists are doing this. And so you can see it's it's tremendous fun. And, and it takes a lot of caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um I guess I'll post the question here, but Don, you can see the QA question posted directly. In your session down there, Q and A. Did you see the part of the Q and A on your menu? Yeah. yeah see, let me buy a okay. Yeah, but I here. for the um, attendees, I'll post this here. Can the, so the next question from he was very uh, very much uh, a question from a person in physics, maybe interested in physics. Can the relation of a decorated per permutation to Grassmanniers be easily shown to polytomes? like uh, amplihedron and uh, would a matrix tensor description expected to appear in that relation or elsewhere yes yeah, so um the answer is yeah these are technical questions that, that have been answered in part by by nima and his, his team so if you want the answers to these questions I, I can send you to two places one is a book by uh nima arkani Hamed and his colleagues i think published in 2016 or something like that, 2016. If you, if you just look online, I can get the title of it. Um, uh, it's something is, if you look up Nimar Khani Hamed Scattering Amplitudes book, 2016, you should be able to find it. It's him and, and, a, and a few other um, authors. But he also gave a course at Harvard in 2019. So if you Google uh, Nimar Arkani Hamed Harvard Lecture One, you can, the, the, all the lectures are online and you can actually, so he has a semester long course at Harvard and it's free to everybody. You can just take his course and get the answer to this question. Hmm. So the answer is yes. <laughs> and the, and you can read it uh, from, from Nima. The next up from Matter, how can any kind of dynamics, even the Markovian uh, dynamics of conscious agents be outside of space and time? Insofar as dynamics unfolds over time and re relativistic time is a Ex excellent question. Um, right. uh, excellent question. So, I mean, I'm talking about dynamics. Surely I'm talking about time. How can I talk about a dynamics of conscious agents beyond space time um, when I'm saying dynamics? So, surely I've got myself in a logical contradiction here. And, and, and so, this is a really interesting uh, technical point. When you write down a Markovian dynamics, it turns out it's, it's straightforward to write down Markovian dynamics in which there is no entropic arrow of time. The, these are reversible Markovian dynamics. But it's a theorem that if you take that dynamics of you know of Markovian dynamics in which there is no entropic arrow of time, and you take a projection of it, so you you get a, a new dynamics which is um, a projection of the original dynamics, say through conditional probability. The new dynamics, it's a theorem, um, will have increasing entropy, and therefore it will have an arrow of time. So the way I'm looking at this right now is we will have this dynamics of conscious agents 
beyond space-time, which, which has no second law of thermodynamics in it. There is no entropic arrow of time. But when you project it uh, via conditional probability, you will get an arrow of time. Now that, now that then leads to a connection with the evolution of natural selection stuff I was talking about earlier, right? In evolution of natural selection, right, you have organisms in space and time competing for limited resources in space and time. What is the most fundamental limited resource? It's time. If you don't, if if you don't get enough food in time, you die. If you don't mate in time, you don't reproduce. If you don't breathe in time, you die. So so time is the fundamental limited resource. So my what's going to be so as I mentioned earlier on in the talk, I used theory of evolution of a natural selection, which is a beautiful theory. I, I, an evolutionary game theory is, is an incredibly powerful theory. And, and, and for evolutionary matters, there is no better tool that we have right now. So, so, so I'm, I have only positive things to say about evolution of a natural selection, and evolutionary game theory. However, what I'm about to say is true of every scientific theory, including my own. No theory is the final word. Every theory makes assumptions, which are the miracles of that theory. And then it says, if you grant me those miracles, I will explain this other stuff. So, so science is never ending. There's infinite job security for scientists because we always have assumptions at the start of our theories. And that's the fun of science. So as good as evolution of natural selection is, and there, and, and there is no nothing even close to being a competitor for it, for explaining biological phenomena and their evolution inside space-time. I want to show that evolution of a natural selection, the entire theory and evolutionary game theory is an artifact of the projection of a dynamics of conscious agents beyond space-time in which there is no limited resource, there is no arrow of time. So all of the, so in other words, our experience of an arrow of time, of competition, of limited resources, is not an insight, is not a deep insight into the nature of reality. It's entirely an artifact of the loss of information from a projection of a much deeper reality beyond space-time. It's, it's infinitely more complicated than space-time. Space-time is a trivial, trivial headset. It's very hard for us to even think outside of that trivial headset because we've worn it all of our life. But science is up to the task. We're about, we're, science is taking the headset off and we're going out and beyond, and we're realizing that there's this infinitely complicated realm outside the headset, and everything that we saw, and most of what we're seeing inside the headset, including evolution of natural selection, is not an insight into the truth outside the headset. It's an artifact of the projection, the artifact of the loss of information. So great question about time. Thank you. The next one from Eva King. Hopefully, this uh, sounds more um, now practical for the social scientist. In this one, this model is uh, consistent with many indigenous uh, cultures, explanation of medicine or how the universe works. My research exams how we form our world, uh, specifically how we form our cultural concepts. We have I have been familiar with uh, Youngs for decades, for decades. Do you have any suggestions on how I can take your model to do a social scientific work? Well, so so first part is yes, I I agree that this is consistent with um, indigenous cultures, oh, and 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 medicine in many ways. It's also um, consistent with many um, um, mystical. Uh, traditions, Buddhist, Hindu, um, mystical Christianity, and so forth, that have said, in addition, that, that space-time is not fundamental, that there's a realm beyond space-time. So it's it's broadly um, consistent with those. And I think that going forward, there should be a good, profitable interaction between science outside of space-time and um, indigenous and mystical traditions that have been thinking outside of space-time for a long time. I think both sides have an important piece of the puzzle. I think the the indigenous and mystical traditions have been thinking about what lies beyond space-time, and so they have some good insights, but they don't have 
the precision and the experiments that science has. So, so they have they have a lot more experience. They have meditation. They so, have, so they have a lot of first personal ex, uh, data, but they don't have the the precision of mathematics and the precision of experiments and the precision of theories that 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 um, you know science has. Science, on the other hand, has um, assiduously stayed inside the headset for the last several centuries. We, they've not gone about outside the headset. And we've only gone outside the headset kicking and screaming because we're forced to by our mathematics, right? We, we, we didn't want to go there, but we have to. So, so here we go. We're, we're taking the headset off, but we have the tools of mathematics and, and precise theories um, and precise experiments um, that, we, that we learned studying our headset. So, so now the scientists are the newcomers to the realm outside of the headset. The mystics and indigenous peoples have been there for a long time. So, so I listen to, I actually spend time listening to um, mystical traditions and, and, and listening to what they say. Now, I take what they say the way I take any scientific theory with a big grain of salt, right? This is I don't take, I mean, I don't believe my own theories, right? If, if you ask me, Don, is your theory true? Absolutely not. It's 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 hopefully a, a good next baby step in science. That's the best I can say. But every theory is not ultimately not true. It's, the question is, is it a good next baby step for science to take? So, so I think I will, you know, I'm trying to look at the ideas from the indigenous and mystical traditions and seeing um, which ones map on to the ideas that I'm already looking at with mathematics and which might complement and, and so forth. And I expect that there'll be some give and take back and forth. I mean, so I, I and I have, you know, I, I enjoy talking with um, mystical people from mystical traditions. I've, I've talked with the Dalai Lama and with, uh, you know, Rupert Spira and, and Deepak Chopra and so forth. So, I, you know, and, so, and, and, and rabbi and, and, and people from you know, Islam. So I, I, I love to talk with these traditions. I, I, again, it's not like it's, uh, there's two extremes. One is to say, I'm a scientist. I don't believe any of this stuff. I'm not going to listen to it. That, that's too extreme. The other is I'm going to believe everything they say. And that's too extreme. So as a scientist, uh, what I want to do is be open, listen very, very carefully, and then use the tools of science um, humbly to try to evaluate and see what of those ideas might help in making the next scientific theory. So that's a long answer to the question, but but you can see it's, it's not a trivial issue, um, right? Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, uh, I know Natalie has a question and we're asking a second since like Heather just supposed to one, that's a follow up to what you just said. So Heather Mahadi was asking a challenge and a response. So indigenous data uh, do exist and is encoded in language. I guess, uh, yeah. Sure. Well, oh, oh, no, absolutely. It, it's um, it, they have they have their own. Uh, you could call them experiments. It, 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 I, I think most scientists would not find them, you know, up to the standard that you know. We, we, but absolutely, it, it's it, so. I'm absolutely not dismissive of of it at all. I think that scientists should look at it with the same hard nose that we look at our own work and everybody else's hard work, right? So, so you, you don't go in with Google eyes. You go in open eyed. And and but with a hard nose, right? You you look at the data and you and and you try to make sure you're not fooling yourself. What we know, looking back at human history, is we knew the Earth was flat. We just knew it. We knew the Earth was the center of the universe, and we killed those who disagreed with us. And now we know that space time is fundamental. And and, and we and so we just get it wrong consistently. And so it's in that attitude that we have to very very humbly say, okay, um, how are we wrong? Our own theories and also, so th it's, it's, it's a real trick to be open enough to learn and yet um, not be fooled. That's, that's, that's the trick. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to like quickly maybe add, like um, I totally agree what's discussed here. And I guess like it's also a change about different level of analysis. And <laughs> now I wonder whether maybe at your level of analysis, your theory is true and at some behavioral level, maybe quantum theory, some of our work will work. But I mean, just for the current state of the work. Oh, well, <laughs> so well, the idea yeah. is to show that quantum theory is a projection yeah. of this deeper Markovian dynamics. So that that's so it's, it's not that 
we're saying quantum theory is wrong. Yeah, I got it. Right. It, it's, it's saying that here is the scope of application of quantum theory. And what quantum theory, the, 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 the weirdness of quantum theory really all arises from the fact that it's about the headset. You have only partial information. That's why we have all these superpositions and all this weird stuff going on. Um, why, why local? So, for example, the Nobel Prize in in physics last December was for the experiment showing um, that local realism is false. So, you, right, lo, local realism is the claim. Realism is the claim that that particles, for example, have definite values of their properties like position, momentum, and spin when they're not observed. That's realism, and locality is the claim that those properties have influences that propagate through space-time no faster than the speed of light. And the, the two together are called local realism. Local realism is false. It's just plain false. It's empirically false. And also uh, the Koch and Specker theorem and, the, and experiments with that show that non-contextual realism is also false. That is, realism is false in conjunction with um, the claim that the properties in, exist independent of the way we measure them. That's the, the contextuality. My take is what physics, what quantum theory has told us is that realism is false, period. Realism is false. What does that mean? Space-time is a headset. You render the particle properties when you need them, and you delete them when you don't. It's just, it's just a VR headset. And so that's what, what quantum theory, the weirdness of quantum theory comes from the fact that it's the theory of the headset and it's not the theory outside the headset. For that, we need to go to this. I'm proposing, again, not the final word, the next baby step. But the next baby step outside the headset is a Markovian dynamics that, that would then projects into the headset and it gives us back quantum theory. And so I take it as an absolutely essential goal of this work that we have to get back quantum theory or a generalization of quantum theory as a projection of this Markovian dynamics or we're wrong. So, so quantum theory has a strong role to play in perhaps rejecting my theory. So we'll see. So quantum theory is on firmer ground than my theory right now. And quantum theory has the, the, the task of showing me wrong or giving me a pass. We'll see. <laughs> oh, there is a way to, like you said, connect to both. That's right, right to, to yeah. connect them, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and this, by the way, uh, an important point here is that this is the way science works is you have a mathematically, you, you have an idea. So Einstein has an idea of space and time are fundamental, right? And in fact, space time is fundamental. And he, he has a couple postulates. The speed of light is universal for all in all reference frames and um, um, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. And you, and you have those postulates and you get um, special relativity and eventually you know, you, with this free falling elevator idea, then you get general relativity. And, and then we take those ideas and we take the, the basic ideas of quantum theory and we make them mathematically precise. So we take our intuitions and Einstein wrestled for famously for seven years or something like that to take his intuition about falling elevators and turn it into general relativity, right? It took him years of hard, and he was Einstein. He's not, not, not Hoffman, he was Einstein. And, he, and it took him all those years to do that. And he finally got the math. So, but then... Once you have your ideas and you make them mathematically precise, the math comes back and it will tell you where your assumptions stop. That is the key thing about science. Einstein, your space time stops at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds, it falls apart. Now you might, you might say, look, if you're a philosopher, you might say, well, that's a self-contradiction. You've got yourself shot in the foot logically, right? So either Einstein's math faithfully modeled his intuitions or it didn't. Now, if it didn't model his intuitions, we couldn't possibly use it to show that his intuitions about space-time were false. And if it did faithfully model them, then they couldn't possibly show that his intuitions about space and time were false. So either way, you, what Hoffman just said can't happen. The mathematics of, of general relativity and quantum theory couldn't possibly show us that space-time is, and, and, and that, so that, that a logical argument completely misunderstands the nature of scientific theories. Every scientific theory starts with assumptions. And those assumptions have a scope and a limit. Every set of assumptions has their scope and limits. A good theory will explore the scope 
and tell you the limits. And that's not self-contradiction. That's the power of science. Thank you, Dan. It's just a said uh, very important to maybe um, people more likely to use nature language for theorizing that uh, sometimes the math because it clarifies the assumptions. Something, yeah. That, that's that, that's right. We we have to start. Uh, sometimes you have to start with a glass of beer. You know, we, wherever you can get. Uh, you know, so Donald Glazer is famous for having the idea for um, bubble chambers for particle experiments from watching. You know, having a glass of beer. You you get your ideas wherever you get them, and then you have to go test them. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Alex by, by the way, I see hand. one. Yeah. I saw Alex one had a here. hand. Sorry, okay. Alex had a hand for a long time. So I'll we'll make sure Alex the one has a question being asked. Then we'll go to you. Then Latali and uh, Lisette, two more okay. questions from the Q&A. Okay, so I, I'm struggling a little bit to see the connection to social science, because it seems like we're talking foundations or below social science in a sense. And I guess one connection that I do see, and I'm wondering if it's real or just imagined, this idea of fusions of consciousness. I mean, there's a big issue in social theory in general about um, collective agents like the government, the state, for example, millions of people are members of the state. And in my field of international relations, it's very common to talk about states as if they were people and they have intentionality, they have beliefs and everything else. And, and I'm wondering, but one of the big challenges in talking about the state as a person is this issue of consciousness and there's no collective consciousness, people would say, and so on. So I'm, so the idea of a fusion of consciousness suggest to me exactly that the state is a person of a kind, um, but I don't know how seriously to take that. And if, if it is a person, then where is the state's experiences, where are they located? Which are they located only in the president or in all the people or whatever? So I guess I'm asking you to kind of play around with fusions of consciousness mapped onto states. Does that work? States in the sense of governments, not in the sense of you know physical states. So. Well. I think that the connection you're making is exactly where we'll have to go, that we'll have to take the idea that when agents interact, they form new agents, and those new agents, um, um, sometimes they'll fuse and sometimes they don't. I mean, they don't always fuse, but sometimes they, but even if they don't fuse, they form a new agent. Um, when they fuse, the what's interesting is that you get a, a, literally a qualitatively new experience that wasn't had by the previous agents. Um, so, so there's, I see no principled obstruction to the application of our theory of conscious agents to the social realm. Um, since the social realm has not been, of course, my area of, of study, but but I would have to say that if the theory of conscious agents does not work there, then that would count against the theory of conscious agents. So that would actually be a good testing ground for the theory. I, I, the theory claims that these can form new units and, and, it's, and it's profitable. Um, to, to think about these units and their interactions. The, 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 what the theory says also though, is don't get addicted to any particular way of carving things up. There's lots of ways to carve things up Do you, and your pet theory may not be the only or the most interesting way of, of carving things up. Um, okay. But I agree, no, I agree with you. It, 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 the theory um, has nothing on, at the front of it that says you cannot use this for social relations and, it, so, and everything to say that it should. Um, but there might be a combination problem then that emerges, I mean, analogous to the panpsychist combination problem of how do you combine individual subjects into a single agent? But we can talk more about that in the one o'clock session. If yeah, let's, let's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. I want to make sure everyone else gets a chance. So, so two more at least. Uh, here, Natalie asked, uh, uh, asked, what's your perspective on Bruins implicate order and how is it related to your theory? Bohm was brilliant. <clears throat> His notion of implicate order is it, it precisely uh, what we're saying here in terms of the um, network of conscious agents beyond space-time. The what we're proposing is is a mathematical model of Bohm's implicate order. Now, I want to distinguish Bohm's implicate order from his um, pilot wave theory. Uh, so, so we're I'm not endorsing his pilot wave theory. Um, inside space-time. That, that, I'm not endorsing that, but his implicate order stuff, absolutely. I think that that is brilliant. And um, you know, looking at his book, I, I just, uh, what a genius. What, a, what an absolute genius. Yeah. Thank you. Now, last one, maybe, again, from a different angle. So Lisa Norenz asks, do you have any personal 
phenomenological experience beyond space time that you can speak of. <laughs> Like do meditation, for example, that helps you understand your research beyond the headset. I meditate um, every day. I have for the last 22 years. Um, and I, I didn't I, I didn't start for any deep spiritual or personal reasons. I just couldn't sleep. So I didn't want to take pills. So I started meditating. But meditation has a way of changing you. And so it has. It's it, um, and I think it's it's helped. So I I I'm sure if I hadn't had trouble sleeping, I would never have meditated. I would just not have done that. So I guess I needed not to sleep, so I would meditate. Um, so and I do find that the meditation. I haven't had any like G whiz experiences, you know, astral projection or you know, nothing like that. So so I, I I've my experience has been mostly facing my emotions, facing my stuff and letting it go, right? So the, the not so fun, but it, but absolutely essential process of, of facing yourself and letting go of your ego and so forth. Uh, but one thing that, that I think has really, really helped from the meditation, you know, one insight that comes from it is don't identify with any thought and don't be addicted to believing your thoughts have a spacious relationship with your thoughts and that helps me to have a spacious relationships with scientific theories as well right we what we don't want to do is to be dogmatic about our scientific theories we'll look like fools in a century we will absolutely look like fools in a century so so you know the, one of the stories we tell is like you know in the 1890s some physicists were saying to bright young students, don't go into physics. You're wasting your time. All the big problems have been solved. You need to go into something else, because they thought Newton would, it was done. New, Newton was right, and 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 we look back and we go, how could you how could you have been so blind? Newton doesn't get you know the black body radiation right, um, and you know and it, it doesn't take care of you know special relativity in general. It, it, Newton was brilliant. It was it was fabulous, but it was just a, the next baby step. And so, what I learned what we what we learn is that every scientific theory should be taken seriously. Look at the math, study the math, look at the experiments, really pound on the theory, see what it says, and and then look for its limits, and never be attached to any theory. Recognize that there's never going to be a theory of everything. There is no theory of everything. The, the, the ones, the, the real scientists who talk about a theory of everything, it's with a wink and a nod. A theory of everything that we know so far. But it, it's, if you ask them, of course not. That we're gonna, you know, it's, it's just what we, the best we have so far. So the meditation really helped me to realize a thought is just a thought. There's always going to be something deeper. And ultimately it face, forces you to face the question, what am I? Who am I? If I'm not any thought, if there's no theory that can ultimately describe who I am, the only way I can know myself is to actually be there without any thought and just be myself. And, 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 and what do I find? So I do find that the meditation, which I just sit there with no thought at all, I let go of all theories of, of myself and the world, just let go of all theories and just be there with utter inner silence, no thoughts, no addiction to any theory about what I am. At a minimum, it opens me up to brand new ideas. It helps me to think out of the box. And perhaps I'm actually facing fundamental reality in some way. I don't know. Okay, seems like a good place to end, actually. But we still yeah. <laughs> now you're in the meditation state or some studying to you. Okay, so okay, Michael has a question. Just raise yeah, hand the panel. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for this uh, wonderful presentation. So I have a, actually a ton of questions, but I will just uh, start with one. So one very concrete is um, in this. Um, interacting network of conscious agents somehow they have to agree 
on a consensus reality which produces space time like three plus one dimension so i wonder can, can you give uh, intuition or a place where to read or about how you arrive at three plus one dimensions right so that's that's exactly what we're working on right now right so what we have to do is to use the mathematics of networks of conscious agents and their interactions which which are computationally universal right so they're like neural networks in that sense what, what we have to do is to show precisely how you can take a network of conscious agents and use it to project the entire network into a three plus one dimensional subset that will just be one projection out of countless right that that will be that's the one we're interested in because that's our that's our trivial headset will be that one so so and that is so to do exactly what you're asking is what is why we came up with this theorem about the decorated permutations because we, we knew that we have to first get the top level map we have to just say a top level how you know abstractly conscious agents map through decorated permutations in the space time but then we have to do what you're saying which is to now actually use the technology of conscious agents and only that technology to construct that map so 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 you can but what we're gonna have to do first though is just make sure we understand the map at high level what does mass spin and so forth correspond to um and that's why at the very start, I came hat in hand and said, we need some high energy theoretical physicists to work with us because we're going to really need, um, you know, someone above my pay grade probably to, to tackle this, this problem. So, but here's, here's the interesting thing. Once we get that, I'm going to be interested to take that network and turn it around and have it look at itself. Right. So what when we have this network, which is projecting the whole big network onto this headset, we turn the headset back onto the network that constructs it. What will it look like inside the headset? I predict it will look like brains and neurons. And that's what brains and neurons are. It's the network that constructs our space time headset focused on itself. So what this, by the way, I should say what this means is. We need more money for neuroscience not less. I, I think that we will never be able to boot up consciousness from, from neural activity. It's not possible. Um, and I have many good friends and colleagues doing that. They're, they're brilliant. It's, it, it's impossible. Neurons can't do it. It's, it's, it's logically impossible because it's, it's a much harder problem. When you see a neuron, that's not because there is a neuron. The neuron is your headset rendering of a much, much more complicated reality behind it. So neuroscience has only looked at the headset of neurons. We have to reverse engineer that headset and there's a much, much more complicated technology behind it. So there is incredible job security in neuroscience going forward. Um, yeah. So, um, well, we do have a small, very special question left here posted actually to the panel right now from Natalie. Vishnevsky was asking for the name of the work of the aspect of Klaus and the linger that received Nobel Prize in 20, 2022. But I think it's a group of work. I think if you Google, it's really a group, a large group of experiments and uh, public. Right. It's um, John. Uh, do you Clouser. have a good reference? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So it, I think it's John Clauser, Alan Aspect, and. Um, uh, and Anton. Zellinger? Yeah, Anton Zellinger, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, if you look up those guys, but if you just look up, uh, you know, Nobel Prize in Physics 2022, just do Google that, you'll get it. So yeah, Nobel yeah. Prize 2022 in Physics. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, quite a body of work. So oh, absolutely. So, okay, I guess that's um, all the question for now. Perfect. Oh, Michael has one more or you have the hands up? Well, I'm not sure if it fits in. I mean, it would be a, one minute. You have twenty seconds. Okay. Well, it would be like um, I'm asking another question coming from Buddhism, uh, and Buddhism built like Shakyamuni Buddha built an entire and one can call it an ontology out of the looking into the question, what is suffering, and like uh, and I ask this question. Uh, like what would be the implications of of uh, if you see of your framework uh, when it comes to how to 
how to uh, lead a peaceful life which is uh, which is uh, steered towards harmony in the in the social world because from buddhism we know all of the violence and anger and uh, are manifestations of a wrong perception and i mean with your uh, approach it's steered towards cleaning up the perception so do you see a link towards uh, a more harmonious way of life in a society uh, like in this type of implications which are relevant also to our bootcamp i i, I do um, that's a great question the it turns out it's a theorem of this theory of conscious agents, that any group of conscious agents is also a conscious agent. That means that if I have a accountable infinity of conscious agents, the power set, there's a power set of possible combinations and therefore a power set, a, a bigger infinity. So if I have ALF zero conscious agents to begin with, there are ALF one combinations and the new agents. Now, take those ALF1 and take their power set. Now there's an ALF2. So you go up Cantor's hierarchy. So what this theory says is that there is ultimately one agent. It's a theorem that any, any agents together form an agent. So there's ultimately one agent, but it's also an obvious theorem that you never get there. It can never be described mathematically. So, but that what that means is, um, what am I? According to this theory, I am the one agent staring through an interface at itself. And so right now, from this point of view, me talking with you know, Alex and Joyce and, and everybody is, is, is me talking to myself through different headsets. So and that's what many mystical traditions have said. You, you know, even in, they'll, they'll say that, uh, you know, love your neighbor as yourself because in some sense your neighbor is yourself. Well, according to the theory of conscious agents, that's precisely right. Your, your neighbor is yourself under a different headset. And, and so in some sense, the, what this says from that point of view is that the suffering is thinking that you're some, it's like someone who puts on a virtual reality headset and thinks that they're the avatar that they see. And so everything that happens to the avatar, they think is really happening to them. No, it's not happening to you. It's happening to your avatar. And, and all the insults of the avatar from other avatars aren't happening. To you. They're just avatar, avatars in, insulting avatars, but that's not you. And so the, the suffering comes from not recognizing that you are this infinite consciousness and your body is merely a space-time headset avatar. And when you get identified, so it's, it's the, it's, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right about this. I'm just saying this is what the theory says, right? So again, my proviso is, my theory is the next baby step is not the final word. But, but now with that proviso, here's what this baby step says. It, it says this, you are the one consciousness, your body is just an avatar and the source of suffering is the false belief that I'm my avatar and that you are different from me, that your avatar is what you are, that you are that avatar. And what I'm seeing is the one consciousness through the screen of limitations, like, but like the arrow of time is a limitation, limited resources, competition, that whole thing is an artifact of the projection. And so it's not to identify with the projection, it's to say, this is a projection of myself but it's just a projection. Of, it's a real projection of myself, but it's just a projection of myself. I transcend this. So I, some, for some reason, the one consciousness needs to project and, and really experience that projection, and then it needs to wake up. Somehow, that's part of what self under. And, and now I'm way over my pay grade. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. And... Uh, now, uh, I think we'll be back uh, at one o'clock mm -hmm. with the question session. And if you see Kelly has posted the link there and you can find that on the website as well. Thank you everyone. Enjoy a quick um, break. And thank you so much for us, to our speakers. Yes, morning. thank you, Don. That was really a, a very wise talk, a lot of wisdom there. So, And I loved how you go beyond your